Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Situation Room from Bora Graphics. This one brought to you not from my office, but because news unfolds, I'm on holiday. I thought I'd do this anyway, let's get into it. Today, we're going to delve into a series of unfolding crises that are reshaping the geopolitical landscape. Our lead story takes us inside Russia, where a catastrophic collapse of the heating grid amidst one of the coldest winters has sparked widespread discontent. Far beyond the war in Ukraine, Russians are now facing a dire domestic crisis with thousands grappling with the bitter cold due to failing soviet era infrastructure. This crisis not only highlights the dire straits of Russian public utilities, but also poses critical questions about the stability of Putin's regime as it struggles with the war abroad and growing unrest at home. Shifting our focus, we're then going to look at Africa, where we witnessed the start of Felix Tshishikedi's second term in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. His inauguration, marred by allegations of electoral fraud and overshadowed by the ongoing violence and instability, signals a precarious future for the nation. With over a hundred militias in the East and the looming threat of civil or even international war, particularly with Rwanda, Shishikedi's leadership faces its toughest test yet. In Sudan, the situation is equally tense. The country's decision to suspend its membership in the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or IGAD, amidst a brutal civil war, marks a significant step back from peace efforts in the region. This move spurred by the legitimization of the Rapid Support Forces, a group accused of war crimes by IGAD, further isolates the Sudanese military junta and potentially hastens the country's slide into deeper conflict and humanitarian crises. As we navigate these complex and evolving situations, we'll keep you updated on the latest developments and provide insights into what they mean for the broader global context. So first of all today, let's look at the story of Russia's failing heating grid. For Ukrainians who lived through the wide-scale misery caused by Russia bombing their energy grid last winter, the news came laced with a gleeful kind of irony. <laughs> Over the last month, more and more footage has appeared on social media documenting houses, apartments, even entire city blocks without heating. In one example, a woman films icicles in her interior stairwell while asking, is everything frozen? Is this normal? Everything is frozen. In another, a large group huddles around a bonfire outside of a housing complex, desperate for warmth. Coming amidst a bitterly cold January, these videos resemble nothing so much as Kremlin-produced propaganda films from last year, which imagined Europeans freezing in their apartments without Russian gas. But this winter's videos come with a twist. Rather than propaganda, they're all real footage taken by real people. And they document not a frozen Germany or France or Poland, but a frozen Russia. A Russia in which the widespread collapse of the heating grid has unleashed a level of discontent unseen in years. The trouble began, according to the Russian independent outlet The Bell, back in December. Late that month, as New Year holiday season approached, heating systems and power cuts struck multiple places from the Baltic enclave of Kaliningrad to Chelyabinsk near the Kazakh border. This in itself is not unusual. As we'll explore in more detail later, Russia's heating system is old and it's underfunded, and breakdowns in cold weather are just an unfortunate fact of life. Now, what was unusual this time was the sheer number of regions affected. As 2024 began, bringing with it temperatures of minus 30 Celsius, which is really bloody cold in Fahrenheit. Outages were reported across the country. Vladivostok in the Far East was hit, as was Petrozavorsk in the North. Yaroslav and Leningrad region suffered, as did the city of Ryazan. In Nizhny Novograd, a pipe carrying scalding hot water exploded, injuring 16 people and flooding the streets. In Novosibirsk in Siberia, 1.5 million people were placed under a state of emergency after three successive citywide heating failures. As the problems multiplied, so too did the reaction on social media. Telegram this January has been filled with videos of people huddled up in winter coats indoors, glumly holding up thermometers which show their apartments at minus 20 Celsius. Again, <laughs> bloody cold in Fahrenheit. It also showed exasperated groups chanting, we are freezing. For Ukrainian and Russian dissident media, these videos have been an absolute goals by a way to show how the Putin regime is failing to meet its own people's basic needs. As the Moscow Times reported with a note of grim satisfaction, bone-chilling weather across much of the country is compounding the severity of what is quickly growing into a major crisis for the authorities. Now look, 
To be clear, there's no suggestion that this crisis might be about to spark an anti-Putin revolution. We've seen similar discontent surrounding things like the 2022 partial mobilization without it ever spilling over into serious street action. That being said, it's clear this grid collapse couldn't come at a worse time. Parts of Moscow Oblast are experiencing their coldest January in four decades. When 20,000 people in Klimovsk lost their heating at the start of the month, it was minus 34 Celsius outside. In Novosibirsk in Siberia, temperatures dropped so low that one former city council deputy told Politico that the situation was life-threatening. On top of that, some regions are reporting power outages and cuts in the water supply, giving the impression of an omni-crisis gripping the nation. In a YouTube interview, former Deputy Minister of Energy Vladimir Milov said that the grid may have finally reached a critical point. If that is the case, then it's not thanks to Western sanctions or Ukrainian sabotage. No, the thing that's made many Russian lives miserable this winter is, ironically, their own government. Specifically, that government's long-term refusal to properly invest in infrastructure upgrades. Modern Russia's heating system still follows the old centralized model of the Soviet years, one in which giant boiler plants on the outskirts of town pump scalding hot water over several kilometers into people's homes and radiators. The trouble with this system is that a single pipe being ruptured can leave entire city blocks without heating, a problem compounded by poor wiring that shorts out if lots of people start using electric heaters. This means that even if it's well maintained, the heating grid is prone to breakdowns. Sadly, well-maintained is something that Russia's system is not. In many cities, it's not just the system that's from the Soviet era, but the equipment and infrastructure too. According to the Moscow Times, the pipes that ruptured in Novosibirsk were laid in 1974. That is not a one-off. Millions upon millions of Russians rely on pipes laid during the communist times. Pipes that, in many cases, were only built to last 25 years. Across the country, 44.2% of utility infrastructure has already passed its life expectancy, and the rate of modernization replacements is slowing every year. Overall, official statistics list 3% of heating water and sanitation network as being in a state of emergency annually. And while 2% are upgraded yearly, those upgrades, well, they often only exist on paper. Politico reports that maintenance and modernization would receive very little public oversight. In many areas, the boiler plants and infrastructure are owned by Kremlin-affiliated elites who use the upgrade funds as a bit of a private piggy bank, really. And the result is what the magazine referred to as a Potemkin-style utilities grid, a reference to the Imperial Russian concept of Potemkin villages, villages that appear prosperous from the outside, but are really just facades with nothing behind them. And yes, before any history nerds would rush to the comments to correct us, we are aware that the origin story of these villages is just a myth. Nonetheless, the phrase is pretty useful in describing modern Russia's infrastructure. Despite all of this, there are signs that the Kremlin is aware of the extent of this problem. The 2023 state budget set aside the equivalent of $2.6 billion for infrastructure renewal. Unfortunately, the rot is now so terminal that experts predict it would cost closer to $200 billion to fix the creaking system. With Moscow spending 30 to 40% of its entire state budget on the war in Ukraine, that sort of money simply doesn't exist. Nor can it be taken out of the regional budgets. Following the chaos of the 2022's partial mobilization, many local governments raided their coffers to provide those fighting on the front lines with equipment. In most places, there's simply nothing left to spend on upgrades. This has led to Oxford University urban development expert Vlad Mikhnenko to tell ABC News that he's expecting an avalanche of disasters in the near future, a moment when the entire system reaches a tipping point that leads to constant, wide-scale breakdowns. But while reaching that point in 2025 or 2026 will be a headache for the Russian state, it's also a little outside this channel's remit. This isn't the infrastructure room, after all. What makes this story suitable for this channel in early 2024 is the potential impact such problems could have on the Russia war effort, specifically how it might affect morale. Despite the narrative that the vast majority of Russians support the conflict in Ukraine, recent polling suggests that support has been softening. A survey by Russian Field at the end of December found that 50% of respondents included an end to the war among their wishes. 
for 2024. Perhaps more notably, a November poll by the independent Levada Center found that while overall support for the war remains high, the percentage who strongly or unquestioningly back it has fallen from 53% in March 2022 to 39% today. The same poll reported a high 57% for the statement, peace negotiations should begin. Now, figuring out what people in an authoritarian state really think is pretty difficult. It's also easy for us outsiders to project what we want to see on such figures. Lord knows enough analysts have predicted imminent revolution over the past two years. Still, a softening of support is what we might expect to see as the war grinds on with no end in sight and the death toll just continues to mount. According to the BBC and media zone's joint counts of Russian war deaths, 42,284 have been killed so far in fighting in Ukraine. Since the team only include deaths that they can 100% confirm using publicly available information, this is likely a significant undercount. So far, the public reaction inside Russia to this slaughter has been muted. Protest is suppressed, and the default mood seems to be apathy. But sometimes in history, a war-weary populace winds up channeling its feelings of frustration into other grievances. The 1905 revolution, for example, grew from a series of strikes related to workplace disputes rather than directly being about Moscow's ill-advised war with Japan. It could be that decades from now, Historians look back on the heating crisis of 2024 as the moment that all the suppressed frustrations at last began to boil over. However, oh, we shouldn't really count on it. As one analyst told Politico, quote, people have short memories. After winter comes spring. Yet even if this ultimately leads to nothing, even if this story is completely forgotten by the time temperatures pick up in March, it's worth paying attention to today. Not least because of what it says about Putin's Russia. Ever since he returned to power in 2012, Vladimir Putin has been on a mission to project an image of Russia as a booming wealthy state, a strong Virar nation that's able to stand alongside the US and China as a true superpower. With an election coming up in March, it's more important than ever for the Kremlin that the wider world sees and believes this narrative. A narrative in which Russia is rising, the West is in decline, and Ukraine will soon fall. It's a narrative in which there's little room for videos of ordinary Russians freezing in their homes. The country unable to even provide that most basic thing of all, adequate shelter from the cold. Now, to be fair, the Kremlin seems to recognize these problems. Our recent weeks have seen a flurry of announcements from the arrests of some boiler plant officials to greater central government control of the system to a new investment fund worth $1.68 billion for upgrades. But it may be too little too late as is often the case with infrastructure, politicians rarely pay attention until it stops working, by which point fixing it has become a complex nightmare. Again, we shouldn't read too much into this. The overwhelming likelihood is that this story's relevance is soon gonna fade. The decades from now, even dedicated historians of this period will have little to say about the Russian heating crisis of 2024, but there's always a remote outside chance that this might spark something bigger. That when the history books are finally written, the blame for the collapse of wartime morale will lie not with Russia's enemies on the battlefield, but with videos of pensioners shivering inside ice-encrusted apartments. Now from Russia, we pivot to a part of the world that we here at The Situation Room have spent months watching with equal parts curiosity and dread. On Saturday the 20th of January, President Felix Shishikadi was sworn in for his second term at the helm of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now at first glance, his was a swearing in like any other. Ushered in with a landslide victory in which he crushed the next closest candidate with fantastic margins, Shishikadi took his oath of office in a stadium in the DRC's capital city of Kim Shasa, surrounded by flag-waving citizens, a national choir, military marching bands, a 21 cannon salute, and representatives from the US, France, China, and a range of other world nations. But look, just barely below the surface, and Shishikadi swearing in was not all what it seemed. Far from a free and fair election, his path to a second term had become an unstoppable process of coronation, one that went exactly as Shishikadi drew it up, despite strong opposition from a massive swath of his own country. We've covered the December the 20th election in past Situation Room installments, but we'll just run through some of the greatest hits for you. During this election, well over a dozen candidates ran to oppose Shishikadi at once, splitting votes between them, despite the fact that this made a Shishikadi victory far more likely. 
polling was delayed by several hours and many polling stations didn't open at all. Some of them continued polling for several days after election day. Some weren't equipped with ballots or other important materials, and many of them used an ink that smudged all over voter cards, making them unreadable and thus ineligible to cast a vote. The process was profoundly non-transparent. Allegations of ballot stuffing and outright electoral fraud have spread like wildfire, and neither African nor European election-observing missions were allowed into the country. Some townships had to have their voting machines trekked for up to three weeks on foot across the jungle. And by the time polling finally closed, most non shishikade candidates had declared that the entire election process was very obviously illegitimate. As candidates and third place finisher Martin Fayulu put it before the results were announced, quote, if a foreign country considers these elections to be elections, there's a problem. As we put it here on Mora Graphics, Mr. Fayulu's got a point. The election was handled in precisely the way that the Congo needed at least, a blatantly authoritarian attempt to rig the vote, which as of January 20th appears to have succeeded. But it also came at precisely the wrong time for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where violence has been ongoing for decades and popular discontent has boiled to historic highs. In the Congo's eastern regions, over 120 armed military insurgencies and rebel organizations battle it out between themselves and against the Congolese government. And a recent offensive by one particular rebel group known as M23 saw large sections of the country captured and millions of people displaced and a million and a half people outright prevented from voting. Violence has been ongoing in many of the Congo cities before and after election day, with youths barricading streets in the city of Goma to demand a revote and a wave of small scale skirmishes and protests breaking out in places where the government's control is believed to be less strong. All this after Shishikedi has struggled to gain legitimacy for years. In his 2018 election, the candidate we already mentioned, Martin Fiulu, is widely believed to have actually won, only to have the results changed or thrown out behind the scenes in Shishikedi's favour. And the peacekeepers that did exist in the Congo, including an East African force made up of troops from neighboring nations and an EU peacekeeping mission that's been there for decades, have now left or begun the process to leave. What all that means is that the Congo has transitioned from being a nation on the brink of either a major change or a major shift toward authoritarianism to now being a powder keg. Although some of Shishikedi's individual policies have been popular and even saved lives in Congo, the heir of legitimacy spent five years trying to build up, and popular discontent has only grown worse in the weeks following the election. Shishikedi's inaugural pledges included initiatives to create more jobs in a country where more than half of the population lives on the equivalent of one US dollar a day and the restructuring of the Congolese defense apparatus in order to address the 100 plus militias in the country's east. But with Shishikedi dependent on armed military police to ward off protesters at even his own inauguration and deploying security forces en masse across the Congo, it appears that he would agree that those promises are not going to be enough. And it's here that we come to the reason, or in this case, the two reasons, why we've got to talk about the Congo on the Situation Room. As it stands now, President Shishikedi and his inner circle are staring down the barrel of two potentially catastrophic options, both of which could happen at once, and both of which the Congo will have to be very lucky in order to avoid. Option one, a civil war at home. Option two, an international war between the DRC and its neighbors, and most likely elements of its own population too. First, the potential for civil war. The eastern reaches of the DRC have never been a particularly peaceful place, and since 1996, conflicts there have killed a total of at least six million people. But since 2022, it's been the aforementioned M23 rebels that have been the main mover and shaker, taking major chunks of territory in the east. M23 are far from anybody's platonic ideal of a freedom-fighting movement. Their forces have been accused by the UN and a range of human rights groups of committing mass killings and using sexual assault as a weapon of war. They're still quite effective, and as of now, they're zeroing in on the city of Goma, the capital of North Kivu province. The city has a metro population of well over half a million people, and for M23 to take the city now, as they did in 2012, would prompt a major escalation in the east. That could go one of a few ways. Either M23 can consolidate its support and keep pushing, or it might attract greater support from some of the Eastern Congo's other militias, or it 
may see a groundswell in support across the country from any number of the Congo's 250 plus ethnic groups and 450 plus tribes. And it's here that we reach the critical question when it comes to a potential civil war. If popular discontent with the Shishikadi administration remains high across the Congo or is strongly concentrated in certain areas, then at what point do the administration's opponents begin considering armed resistance of their own? Certainly, global history would indicate that, that giving Shishikadi more time to consolidate his own authority will just make it harder for a resistant movement to succeed later. And with the Congolese opposition temporarily unified in their disdain for the electoral process, it might be now or never for these opposition groups to stand against Shishikadi. If they choose to do so, then the next question is whether the abundance of armaments, experienced fighters, and militia infrastructure in the country's eastern reaches is going to be held at arm's length as a separate insurgent movement, or seen as the group of people within the Congo with the best saturation of knowledge and warfighting equipment when it comes to actually carrying out an insurgent movement. Then there's the possibility of a foreign war, where the main international player most likely would be neighbouring Rwanda. Historically, Rwanda has played a major role in Congolese conflicts, particularly the Second Congo War, where Rwanda invaded the DRC in 1998 with the goal of creating a border zone that would war Rwanda's population off from the militias of the Hutu tribe in the DRC's eastern reaches. As for why that might have been important for Rwanda, well, we'll leave it up to you to look at the Rwandan genocide on your own time. The Second Congo War was incredibly destructive, both to the Congo and to its people. And since then, Rwanda's influence in the Congo hasn't gone away. The M23 group that we've kept referencing today are primarily an ethnic Tutsi militia, the same ethnic group that was targeted in the Rwandan genocide and whose Rwandan patriotic front now controls Rwandan politics in what is basically a one-party system. For years, Shishikadi and his predecessors have accused Rwanda of funding and supporting M23, and they've alleged that Rwanda is behind M23's new offensive in northern Kivu province. The African Union, the European Union, and the United States all agree that Rwanda has at least played some role in M23's resurgence, and the UN has warned that an open military confrontation could easily break out between the two nations. For a very brief moment in 2023, it seemed as if a US-negotiated bilateral agreement between Rwanda and the DRC might put some of their more recent tensions to rest, at least for a while. But naturally, Shishikadi had to go and compare Rwandan President Paul Kagame to Adolf Hitler, and things sort of predictably degraded from there. With the prospect of a possible shift in the DRC's leadership, however unlikely it might have been, Rwanda has been hesitant to step in. But now Shishikadi's re-election and his obviously weak position may lead Rwanda to a very different calculus. Shishikadi and his government have been unafraid to demagogue against Rwanda in order to drum up support, including this particular gem of a quote, which we're actually not going to scream at you now, like Shishikadi himself screamed it at a crowd of supporters during the campaign season, quoting, I've had enough of invasions and M23 rebels backed by Kigali. If you re-elect me and Rwanda persists, I will request Parliament and Congress to authorise a declaration of war. We will march on Kigali. Tell Kagame those days of playing games with Congolese leaders are over. War with Rwanda is not a guaranteed victory for the Congo, and not by a long shot. But in the short term, it may be a calculated play from Shishikadi and his inner circle to try and rally popular support at home. Before the 2023 electoral cycle concluded, there weren't many things more unpopular in the Congo than Shishikadi himself, but Rwanda was certainly one of them. If Shishikadi is correct in thinking that that same animosity toward Rwanda still exists, then declaring war and beginning a march on its capital, Kigali, offers a clear path for Shishikadi to get the population back on his side, especially if he can secure a victory. But there's also some pretty major potential for his calculus to be off, and if it is, then he's going to be in serious trouble. Without popular support for a war, Shishikadi will face problems from a potential lack of will to fight within his own military, to public apathy in the face of Rwandan counterattacks, to potential riots or insurgencies by Congolese popular resistance movements, while the military is distracted, to even a non-zero likelihood that elements of the Congolese opposition would take Rwanda's side in a conflict rather than Shishikadi's. That last option is, at present, extremely unlikely, given how the average Congolese citizen feels about Rwanda. But if Rwanda were able to frame its own potential counter-offensive as an attempt to, let's say, install Martin Fiulu or 2023 runner-up Moise Katumbi as the head of a new government, 
but that maths could change. If a direct military confrontation were to break out, the DRC's chances of victory would be poor from the outset. Rwanda maintains one of Africa's most respected and best equipped militaries, while the Congo is notoriously corrupt and has a very poor reputation for the order and discipline of its troops. At its disposal, Rwanda has several land divisions, dozens of tanks, a handful of attack helicopters, hundreds of infantry fighting vehicles and personnel carriers, and a relatively impressive defense budget, as well as troops who've picked up experience in peacekeeping missions and battles with DRC-based rebel groups. Meanwhile, the DRC's military equipment is believed to be in disrepair, and while it's got more tanks, a couple of fighter aircraft and attack aircraft, and more attack helicopters, very little of that kit is believed to be of any use at all. Nearby Burundi, which may be drawn into the conflict to try and rein in either nation if they mount a major offensive, has a decently well-equipped military, but it's generally not taken to be quite so advanced enough to stop Rwanda in its tracks. And if it's Rwanda trying to stop the DRC, then Burundi's help probably isn't necessary anyhow. But if war does break out, it's far from certain that it would stay a civil war or even a regional conflict. It's the same reason that Congo has been such a disproportionate interest to the West in recent years, despite its minimal economic power. The Congo is incredibly rich in natural resources, especially cobalt, copper, gold, and diamonds. And while the DRC largely lacks the infrastructure to exploit those resources themselves, they're more than willing to charge other countries a fee to come in and mine what the Congo's got. During the 2010s, the Congo's resources were largely under American control, but now China maintains a controlling influence after most of America's mining operations were sold off. Regardless of who controls the mines, the rest of the world has a vested interest in making sure that they're kept safe. Except, with the UN leaving, China is hesitant to leave any larger of a footprint than they have to. And with very few other peacekeeping influences in the Congo right now, the safety of those resources is very much in doubt. What that means is that a major conflict in the Congo can become highly internationalized very quickly. For a recent example of this phenomenon, look no further than Libya, where global and regional powers descended in the 2010s in order to have some say in the outcome of a major civil war that would decide the control of Libya's immense oil reserves. In the Congo, a similar breakdown can draw in quite a few players. China would be first on the list, with an intense interest in protecting the mining operations there. China's already made a habit of supporting the Congolese government by providing drones and weapons, and they'd likely back the Shishikadi government as a potentially stabilizing force. France may look to take action in one of Africa's many Francophone nations, despite recent troubles in the Sahel region, and the European Union and the United States have a similarly vested interest in resolving a conflict there to protect the flow of resources needed for the high-tech industry. While Russia proper may not make much of an attempt to resolve violence in the Congo, at least not right now, there's a much greater possibility that Africa-based remnants of the Wagner Group may set up shop in the DRC. Rumors around Wagner's potential presence there, probably offering their security to support to the Shishikadi the government in exchange for resources rights have been spreading for months, and with the African Wagner detachment seemingly increasingly untethered from Moscow's authority, their involvement in a potential conflict could go any number of ways. In the coming months, the Congo is likely to remain on a hair trigger, with any de-escalation likely to be slow and gradual as opposition movements slowly lose the will to challenge Shishikadi's dominance. But if tensions do spiral out of control, it's far more likely to happen suddenly, with Shishikadi launching a shock and awe offensive meant to rally the Congolese people before his international backers can talk him out of it, or with a redoubled M23 offensive, or even a Rwandan invasion while Shishikadi looks to be at his weakest. And finally today, we're going to remain focused on Africa as we leave the Congo and travel northward to Sudan. There, a nine-month civil war between the Sudanese army and a rival paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces has continued despite intense violence on both sides, and unfortunately the three people caught in the crossfire, this week saw Sudan take a major step away from potentially ending the fighting. The trouble stems from the Sudanese military's decision to suspend its membership in a regional diplomatic bloc called the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or IGAD. Founded in 1996, IGAD is made up of Sudan and seven other nations, South Sudan, Kenya, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and Uganda. While their general goal is to transform Northeast Africa into an upper-middle-income region and, quote, a continental beacon of regional peace, stability, and security by 2050, which, by the way, does not seem to be going well, it's also played a major peacekeeping role in the region. 
In 2005, Ayngad was instrumental in ending a 22-year-long civil war also in Sudan, and in Somalia in 2004, it was Ayngad that facilitated the creation of a transitional government there. Ayngad also sent its own troops to lay the groundwork for a current African Union mission, which is hard at work trying to deal with Somalia's mess of insurgencies. All that is to say that Igad is both a fairly important regional body and also a fairly effective one when it comes to keeping the peace in Northeast Africa and especially in Sudan. So when Sudan refused to show up at a summit in Uganda in January of 2024, that very quickly became a problem. Sudan's reason for refusing to show up was fairly straightforward and honestly pretty understandable from the perspective of the Sudanese military. The leader of the Rapid Support Forces, a general named Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, who's much better known by the name of Hamedi, had been invited to the summit, which might not have been a problem except Hamedi's RSF forces had spent the last nine months trying to overthrow Sudan's ruling military junta in a conflict that's killed well over 10,000 people and displaced over 7 million. Now, we here at War of Graphics are not experts on the internal discussions held between leaders of the IGAD bloc. However, we'd be willing to bet one of two things were true. Either Igad understood that Sudan wouldn't want to engage in the summit if the RSF were invited and went forward with the summit anyway, or otherwise they'd somehow fail to realize that the massive civil war that had been ongoing for the better part of a year might have resulted in some hurt feelings. Why do we suspect this? Well, because Sudan's civil war was at the top of the docket at the IGAD summit, and without Sudan's leaders being present, IGAD nonetheless used the summit to call for a, quote, immediate and unconditional ceasefire. Moreover, they demanded that the Sudanese military and the RSF have a face-to-face -face meeting within two weeks of the closing day of the summit. Shockingly, Sudan didn't respond well to IGAD's ultimatum. Shortly after the summit ended, Sudan's foreign ministry, loyal to the military, announced that it would no longer be engaging with IGAD diplomatically. Two days later, they took an even firmer stance. Sudan would suspend its own membership in IGAD in direct protest to the bloc's ultimatum. According to Sudan, the decision to invite RSF General Hamedi violated Sudanese sovereignty and set a precedent that Sudan could not abide by legitimizing the RSF with an invitation to partake in the summit. Now, regardless of your stance on the Sudanese civil war, there's very little room to dispute the claim that Hamedi and the RSF looking for legitimacy wherever they can get it. In past months, General Hameti has gone on a diplomatic tour, meeting the heads of state of Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, and a range of other highly influential African nations. Clearly, he was also quite happy to attend the IGAD summit, which he did despite knowing that the Sudanese military is staying home. Meanwhile, the Sudanese military hunter is growing more and more isolated, particularly because of the RSF's increased diplomatic overtures to the rest of the region, and partly because the hunter itself is not particularly beloved on the continent anyway. The RSF and Sudanese military had jointly staged a coup back in 2021 that had undermined Sudan's transition toward a democratic rule, and that had actually been set to merge in 2023 before civil war broke out, but now it appears to be the RSF that's captured the favour of IGAD and the African continent in charting Sudan's ideal path forward. With that sea change comes even more isolation for the Sudanese junta, and by refusing to engage in diplomatic processes like IGAD, Sudan has now massively lowered the likelihood that it can turn the tides in its own favour. As international support continues to shift in Hemeti's favour, the RSF's ultimate endgame appears to grow clearer and clearer. That is, the RSF is seeming to want to position itself as a democratising force in Sudan, as evidenced by Hemeti's emphasis on meetings with pro-democracy figures abroad. Meanwhile, both sides continue to commit war crimes, including indiscriminate attacks on civilians, torture, arbitrary detention, and in the RSF's case, use of ethnically motivated massacres and widespread sexual assault as weapons of war. Neither the junta nor the RSF have been even tangentially interested in toning down their conduct in war or presenting themselves as a believable, democratizing force within Sudan itself. But with only two options to choose from, the international community has been placed in a position to make an urgent choice between the lesser of two evils. And they seem to have decided that the lesser evil is the RSF. All that despite the fact that much of the world, including the US, has accused the RSF of committing crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing in Sudan's West Offer state. Hermeti has been willing to apologize for those actions, blaming them on rogue actors within the RSF, and his continued attempts to push the world's focus towards Sudan's future after the war concludes has seemingly been rather successful so far. On the ground, the situation continues to swing in the RSF's favor. The RSF has continued to cement its position in Darfur, and it controls significant 
northern portions of the capital city of Khartoum, where its forces are holding their position while war rages in the countryside. The RSF has made major gains in Gazira State, and as we write this episode, they appear on track to capture the city of Al Managil, the last major town in Gazira State that isn't yet under RSF control. The group has the support of the United Arab Emirates and Libya's breakaway warlord Khalifa Haftar, and they've been accused of receiving missiles from the Wagner Group as well. Recently, a yes unpublished report by the UN has circulated to international media implicating the UAE in direct shipments of weaponry to the RSF and smuggling lines through the neighboring nation of Chad. Meanwhile, the Sudanese hunter's most important supporter is Egypt, which is currently far too busy dealing with the ongoing war in Palestine to be able to devote major resources to counterbalance the Emirates. Iran is known to have supplied Sudan's army with combat drones, news that broke on January 24th, but whether shipments of drones will be enough to turn the tide remains to be seen. More likely, the move is part of a much larger Iranian effort to leverage its international connections, like it's doing with the Houthi rebels in Yemen or Hezbollah in Lebanon. With support for the Sudanese junta thus seeming a step behind what the RSF can leverage, the turning tides of international opinion could see a swell in support for the RSF both financially and possibly even militarily. With one party in Sudan but still willing to negotiate with IGADs, and with IGAD in perhaps the best position in Africa to directly intervene and put a stop to Sudan's civil war, the Sudanese hunter's refusal to work with IGAD may have just made the bloc's decision for it. Meanwhile, in a further knock on the idea that the RSF are the harbingers of Sudanese democratization that they claim to be, recent reports have circulated indicating in the capital of West Darfur State, the city of Al Janina, that the RSF may have been responsible for the deaths of between 10 and 15,000 people. That number, proven true, would double the current death toll in Sudan's recent violence. According to the report issued by an expert panel at the United Nations, the RSF planned and executed a massive ethnically motivated massacre in the city while aided by local Arab militias. Together, the RSF and the militias are accused of having targeted, quote, civilian neighborhoods, internally displaced persons, IDPs, gathering sites and IDP camps, schools, mosques, and hospitals. Those massacres were targeted toward the local Masalit ethnic group and used snipers placed on main roads to target civilians, including women and children, indiscriminately. Not only that, but the report also accuses the RSF of violating an arms embargo to acquire unmanned drones, howitzers, and rocket launchers, which are now allowing them to turn the tide in Sudan's battlefields. These stunning figures should, by all accounts, be a major detriment to the RSF's claims of legitimacy. But we must stress here that the IGAD's actions in recent days have all come after accounts of the UN report became available. As it appears now, the East African community may be on the verge of conclusively picking a side in the Sudan conflict, a move that would likely tilt the balance of the war so heavily into the RSF's favor that the Sudanese junta would be unable to recover. What comes after an eventual junta defeat and what an RSF administration in Sudan would mean for the ethnic minorities that have already been targeted with outright ethnic cleansing, we can only imagine. But those potential outcomes are certainly not encouraging. And in the coming weeks, we'll return here on War of Graphics to report the coming evolutions in Russia and Ukraine, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Sudan. We'll continue to provide coverage of the defining conflicts of this historical moment, and keep a keen eye toward the crisis spots and tension spots from which the next major conflicts could very rapidly erupt. For now, though, signing off. Thanks for being here.